10 years. That's how long I've been covering the world of hi-fi and the gear we use to listen to music to get better sound into our lives. So in this video, I wanna tackle 10 things that I have learned in those 10 years. Hi-fi gear is an intellectual pursuit, but also a sensory pursuit. So we can discuss and debate the merits of a piece of hi-fi gear online, you know, in Facebook groups and on forums, but there is no substitute for actually sitting down and listening. There is no substitute for first-hand experience. Talking of senses, looks matter. It's not just the sound of the gear that influences the way we feel, because obviously music is a mood-altering substance, if you like, right? So when we sit down to listen to music, we're having our mood changed, shifted, or even maintained, actually. Um, but we very often have to look at the gear that we're using to play back music, especially speakers. And the things that we look at also change the way we feel. This is why art has existed for centuries, you know, paintings. We look at a painting, it changes the way we feel because of its visual presence. And that's the same with anything that we look at. And that includes loudspeakers and to a lesser extent, the electronics that we might have in a rack off to the side or sometimes in the middle of the speakers. So looks matter, they matter hugely. And looks mattering is possibly even more of an acute an issue with headphones and earphones because these are things that we wear. It's like the clothing that makes music. We put them on our head. It's like wearing a hat or wearing a hood or something like that. And you know, earphones, they're not too far away from earrings. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's something that's in our ears. We do not want something that makes us feel ridiculous in our ears. So basically what I'm saying here is like headphones and earphones are just like clothing or jewelry. The room is the most important component in any loudspeaker system. So headphone guys get a pass on this one, but if we're listening to loudspeakers, the room matters the most. It has the most impact on sound. Now, I learned this pretty early on, maybe 2011, 2012, maybe even sooner, I'm not sure. But it, it changed the way that I read reviews or the way that I looked at reviews in that I put more stock in a review that shows the listening room than one that doesn't. And I think this is what really got me hooked on Six Moons early on because Srijan is very keen on showing all of his listening spaces. And I learned from that and I decided, yeah, that's something I need to do. And obviously you can see my listening room here. So yeah, I infuse all of these videos with shots of my room. I talk about my room all the time, six meters by five meters. It's actually come a long way this year because I've installed acoustic panels by GIK Acoustics. So you've got diffusers and absorbers on the wall. And then this corner and over here and over here, that probably you can see this one. These are 35 hertz-ish, wideband-ish bass traps. Not everybody will want these kinds of things in their room, but it's just another example of how when you add these things, you realize how much the room was previously taking away from what I or you might hear. So when music is typically made, most times it's made in a studio or a home studio, it's recorded and then it's handed off to the mastering engineer who makes it hopefully sound better. And then it is parceled off to the pressing plant or to the CD factory or you know, the file is just given over to download and streaming services. Now, which one of these particular stages impacts what we hear the most? The answer is really a combination of recording quality and especially mastering quality. And these two things matter far, far more than the delivery container, whether it be vinyl, CD, a download or a stream. 
and they matter more, mastering, recording quality, these things matter more than whether that stream is lossy or CD quality or high res. So mastering quality matters more than high res audio delivery. Bluetooth audio is a bit of a mess. And that's a big claim to make, but it really isn't understood very well by the majority of consumers. Because we might think that Bluetooth audio, a connection between a phone and say a pair of noise cancelling headphones, or a phone and a streamer, we might think that that always sounds the same. But it doesn't. It depends upon the phone, the sender, and the headphones, the receiver. It depends upon the codecs loaded in, into those sender and receiver. So what we hear is determined by the codec used. So it could be AAC, it could be Aptex, it could be LDAC, it could be a, any number of other smaller, lesser known codecs. But they can elevate or decrease the sound quality of a Bluetooth connection. And also, and I think this only comes to light recently, like let's say you're using AAC, it's been discovered that AAC transmission from an Android phone doesn't sound as good, doesn't have the, the measured values actually, of AAC from an iPhone. Now the average consumer doesn't know this. I mean, they see like Aptex on a box. I mean, do most iPhone users know that Aptex has no relevance to them because Aptex is not installed in an iPhone? It's, it's just all over the place. And then it's compounded by manufacturers who insist on saying that their Bluetooth device is high res capable, which it kind of is. Yes, it will play a file, but it's not giving you the same high res that we know and expect to hear from network streaming over ethernet and Wi-Fi. It's not really high res audio because a Bluetooth connection throws information away always. It cannot do lossless transmission from phone to headphone or phone to streamer. It doesn't exist. So this high res thing is just, it's a bit of marketing bullshit really, but it's, it just adds to this confusion and adds to this sort of overall idea that Bluetooth audio is just a jumble of very confused ideas. It's a mess. Digital audio is not just ones and zeros, just ones and zeros, no. And this is a bit of a controversial one, because if like me, you were born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s during the launch of the compact disc, you will have been exposed to a lot of messaging from Sony, from Philips, from other CD manufacturers that digital audio is perfect, that it's just ones and zeros. But in the 90s, that thinking began to change. And if you speak to any digital audio engineer now, they will tell you that the carriage of ones and zeros from the streamer to the DAC is loaded with two key problems. Number one is jitter. That's the timing of those ones and zeros going all the way into the DAC. And the second one is electrical noise generated by the streamer or the computer that feeds the DAC. And different streamers generate different amounts of jitter and electrical noise, and different DACs have different levels of immunity to that jitter and that electrical noise. So most DACs that we're using will not be immune to the issues that live inside our streamers. And this problem isn't just a hardware issue, it's a software issue. So different software on the same hardware, unbelievably, but in reality, can sound different. And that's the thing. Many of us here, not just me, many of us 
hear differences in digital audio sources. And also very often the people arguing against this are the people who have not put in the listening time. They're arguing from the trenches, self-dug, of a theoretical opinion. Whereas that directly contradicts direct experience and the work of engineers in this field, the experts in this field. Now, if you're on the fence, one thing you can do is take what I call the Audivana challenge. It will cost you no money. It'll take you about half an hour. And that's download the program Audivana to your PC or to your Mac. Audivana is spelled A-U-D-I-R-V-A-N-A. -A. Download that. Play back a favorite song using your existing music playback software. So that could be iTunes, it could be FooBar, it could be VLC. And then play that same song back with Audivana and see if you hear a difference. Because I do, and many Audivana users do, and it shows that even though it's the same file going through the same hardware, that it can still sound different. So yeah, try it for yourself. Do your own first-hand experience test. Now related to digital audio, not being just ones and zeros and streamers sounding different to each other is the ghost, <laughs> the ghost or the ghost of CDs. Because for me, the best digital audio transport consistently in the last 10 years has been a CD transport. So at the moment, for the, in fact, for the last few weeks, I've been playing nothing but CDs through the PS Audio. And for me, that sounds better than any streamer that I own. And it's possibly because it's not a computer. It's just a laser reading a disc and maybe because it has a lower electrical noise output. But I've done this experiment on and off over the last 10 years, different CD players versus streamers, just for my own edification, really. And the CD player always wins out. And I find that a little bit frustrating, actually, because it keeps me in, you know, my interest in CDs, which is actually probably a good thing, because when we buy CDs, the artist gets paid more than if we stream a file. A straight wire with gain isn't as good as it sounds on paper. I'll explain why. Many DAC manufacturers now put a volume control on their DAC. So theoretically, we can go direct from the volume control DAC into a power amp. Now I've done this many times over the years, and what I tend to find is going DAC direct into the power amp makes music sound very fast, very quicksilvery, very detailed, but a bit thin. It lacks that kind of substance, that mass. And I tend to almost always find that putting a preamp back in between the DAC and the power amp brings back that substance, that mass, that tonality, and also that many textural qualities. I think going DAC direct tends to erode surface textures a little bit. Now, why is this? Well, I think it's to do with impedance. I'm not entirely sure, I'm a little bit hazy on this, but the volume control on the DAC can mess with the impedance relationship between the source and the power amp. And putting a preamp in the middle restores that impedance relationship or doesn't allow the DAX volume control to mess with it. So really, even though we think, or Occam's razor might tell us, that a DAC with a volume control into a power amp is the best because it's the most simplistic configuration for a hi-fi system, inserting a preamp makes a lie of that. Newcomers to the audio world, the hi-fi world, will often see <laughs> pretty much everywhere or hear everywhere that nothing beats the sound of vinyl. That vinyl is king, that vinyl is amazing, that it will always sound better than anything you can stream or play on a CD. It's not true. My experience tells me this is not true. For example, like, can we really expect a $200 project turntable plus phono stage to outstrip, say, a Griffin CD player which sells for 14 grand? It's not the money thing, it's just 
the engineering that goes into the Griffin is far, far more advanced than what goes into the project, which is severely limited. So we know that a budget entry level turntable cannot sound, not cannot, but usually does not sound better than high end DAX, streamers, CD players. So don't buy into this idea that nothing beats the sound of vinyl because very often that's nostalgia driving that kind of messaging. Or maybe it's just familiarity, I don't know, because most audiophiles are of a certain age, you know, 40 plus, 50 plus, they grew up with vinyl. So of course many of them are gonna have this very strong affinity still with the format. But that doesn't mean that it sounds better than digital. In fact, I mean, I use a, at the moment, I use a Technics SL 1210 GR. And I've got an Autophon 2M Black on it. Does it sound better than, than my best DAX and streamer combos? Not really. It's a bit softer and it's a bit nicer in the top, but it doesn't have the resolve or the punch or, or the separation that, say, a Mola Mola Tambaki will have. It's just not the same. And I think you really have to spend upwards of like five grand, maybe even 10 grand to get to a point where you go, yes, I can confidently say that this turntable front end outstrips a digital front end of a similar price. There is no such thing as an absolute sound. I know people want to think they're moving to some kind of target point and that target point has been defined by third parties so we're all on this journey towards one single point but i really don't think that's true and <laughs> take for example like very expensive loudspeakers you know these are statement speakers made by engineers who have basically thrown away any cost limitations so this is like cost no object loudspeaker and they couldn't sound more different like a Magico doesn't sound like a YG, doesn't sound like a Wilson. So we're not all converging towards the same point. It's, it, no, it's just not happening. And that's because we all have different tastes and we all have different rooms. Remember how the room is the biggest influencer on the loudspeaker sound? It's that, it's, I mean, yeah, it's how the loudspeaker couples to the room determines what we hear. So different rooms might determine what loudspeaker we choose. Well, not might, definitely will. So not only do our rooms determine the speaker, our own subjective tastes do. I mean, we, we might not like bass. Other people might like lots of bass. We might like a more forward mid-range. Other people might like a more crystalline treble. And all of these possibilities are, are available from a wide range of loudspeakers, and none of them sound the same. And then, what we enjoy is also determined by the music that we listen to. If we listen to very poorly recorded music, we might not want a loudspeaker that reveals all of the problems with that recording. We might want a little bit of obfuscation, a little bit of blurring of those details. But if we only listen to pristine recordings in DSD or 24192, then those higher end, more revealing loudspeakers or amps are open to us as possibilities. But again, that, you know, what I might choose the loudspeaker to kind of cover up the nasties in a future of the left record might not be what somebody chooses who listens to, I don't know, like Joe Bonamassa, who's like the white bread of blues. Um, yeah, if somebody listens to him, they might want a very revealing loudspeaker. So yeah, this idea of an absolute sound that we're all moving towards is just poppycock. As you can tell, this was a very much an off the cuff, ad hoc, unscripted video. I had 10 ideas that I wanted to talk about and I kind of rambled through them. If you like that approach, then please do check out my Patreon where I'm making more extended vlogs exclusive to Patreon about these sort of general matters, but I'm also doing them outside where I can show you different parts of this wonderful city, Berlin. If you like this video, please hit the like button down here. If you like my sort of generalized attitude towards the world of high-end audio, 
in that it's not perfect and there are some very fundamental problems to kind of, no, not problems, realities to face up to, then please subscribe to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. <laughs> you don't know what poppycock means, do you? No. <laughs> poppycock is a very, um, it's a very British way of saying it's nonsense. And even though it has the word cock in it, it's not rude.